Good afternoon. Thank you for coming, everyone. Today, I'm going to teach you how to build a smart boombox. We'll do a little introduction and a history of how we, I got here, goals and principles of the current boomboxes I'm working on, talk about sound design, woodworking design, and CNC machines, uh, electronics and components like speakers, amplifiers, power supplies, etc. Then computer, hardware and software, for a boombox to be smart, probably needs a computer. And then Mycroft, which is an open source personal voice assistant software. And then I'm going to teach you how to build one in, in 14 easy steps, hopefully, in a, in a summary. Okay, my name is Mike McIsaac. I, uh, after high school, I joined the Marine Corps for four years, and I learned how to repair radios, and that's where I started with my electronics. I think I always had woodworking in my blood since I was a teenager. I think I have sawdust in my blood. Um, then I went to Northeastern University and got a uh, comp sci degree and uh, got a job at IBM, and I still work on IBM mainframes, so I've been doing IT, mainly IBM Linux on IBM mainframes, for 35 years. So a history of the smart boombox, how did we get here? Probably started, my son was about this tall, 10 or 11, and I was on a conference call, and all I had was a cell phone, no, no, you know, and, and, the, and the sound wasn't too good. And my son said, Dad, you know, if you put your cell phone in a bowl, it sounds better. And sure enough, it did. And what I realized is that bowl was effectively a horn. And then I got interested in, I, I made a cardboard gramophone for my cell phone. And then I tried smith horns and folded horns, and they were bigger. I'll show you some pictures of them. And then finally, my buddy and I started working, and we got to a boombox, which is kind of the right form factor. And the first boombox had no Bluetooth. So I asked one of the children, hey, try your song. Well, what, what do I pair to? You know, what's, what's the Bluetooth, right? It doesn't have a Bluetooth. Well, for the kids, it has to have a Bluetooth. But then um, my aunt and uncle wanted one, and my, and my mom, and they didn't even know how to use Bluetooth. And so, the user experience was not too good if, if you have to drive it with your cell phone. So I said, well, wait a minute. You know, as of now, in my car, I've been bringing music up by voice for like 15 years. So a boombox should be able to bring up song, sounds by, uh, songs by voice, right? So that was the big idea. And then I found Mycroft. I was stumbling along trying to find software to do you know, voice input, and then I found Mycroft. Okay. So here's the cell phone in a bowl. There's the cardboard gramophone. This is a Smith horn. It looks pretty cool, but it didn't really sound that great. This is a, this is a folded horn. This sounded better. Uh, the, the sound comes out of here, down here, and you can see the horn is getting bigger. You know, like a, a, a bugle or a saxophone is effectively a folded horn, right? And the sound comes out here. And the guy who designed this, I never could have designed something like this said if you put the speakers in the corner of the room, the, the corners of the room become the rest of the horn, and you'll get better bass response, and that one sounds good. But I'm talking about boom boxes today. Here's the first prototype. You'll see there's three holes, and there's dividers, uh, separators in here, and you can see a fourth hole in the bottom, and there's another enclosure for the components at the top. All right, fast forward to today. This is the latest model we have. We call it the Model 1000. Still only three speakers. Well, that looks like a speaker, but it may or may not be. Um, there's a quiz later on uh, woodworking design. So how do the moldings, how do, how do these moldings maybe differ? Think about it. And this molding is decorative. Without that, it looks kind of plain. We, you know, the, the, we called the first one the wedding cake, which had different size. But we put this molding in, and a lot of people just say, yeah, that's, that looks nice. And, of course, there's an amplifier up on the right side with multiple buttons and an aux in or line in, but also a headphone out jack, so two jacks. What are the goals and principles? Well, you know, the first goal of a boombox is it's got to sound great. It's got to play music really well, right? And retro look and quality craftsmanship, I say. There's all kinds of music devices out of there. Many of them sound great. Um, many of them look okay, but I don't think you're going to find very many with, you know, solid plywood, good hardwoods, and usually if it's wood, it's medium density fiber, fiberboard painted black. I don't consider MDF wood. It's just like sawdust and glue sandwiched together. <laughs> okay, ease of use, I talked about that. So if you want to be able to talk to your 
uh, boombox. You need uh, voice input, which requires SOC, system on a chip. We use the Raspberry Pi 4. And once you have that on board, you, you get some bonuses, right? If you have a personal voice assistant and it, you only want it to do music, well, why not let it do all the other things that you, voice assistant, you know, general question answering, what's the weather, what's the news, et cetera. And that's all available. And also, a, a lot of uh, Internet of Things devices uh, pare down the operating system so that it just does one thing. And I said, well, if a Raspberry Pi has enough horsepower to be a general purpose computer, why not let it out? And so that's the model. You don't have to use it as a general purpose computer, but you can. So I say, is it a boombox that's smart, or is it a general purpose computer with great sound? And I would argue it's either one you want it to be, OK? What are the principles? Free and open source software, that's why we're here. I have always been a proponent of it. Um, Richard Stallman and Linus Torvalds are two of my personal heroes. Even Upton's a new one. Uh, but I, I did not know that Linus Torvalds was going to be speaking here and live. You know, I thought it was going to be a Zoom meeting. But, um, so that was a pleasant surprise this morning. Uh, anyway, I digress. Uh, fair, fair compensation for musical artists, I'll talk about that briefly. And privacy, I think that's important. A lot of people I talk to say, yeah, I like uh, you know, personal voice assistants like Alexa and uh, Google Home or what have you. I think those are the two most popular. But I don't want them listening to my pillow talk in my bedroom and recording everything, right? And um, Mycroft is based on privacy. I'll talk a little bit about that. Sound design, a, a 2.1 system. So the two is the left and right channels, usually recorded in stereo. The, one, the point one is the subwoofer. Uh, the left and right enclosures are ported, so speakers go into enclosures. There's, in general, three types of enclosures. One is completely sealed, so you put the speaker in one hole and everything else is sealed. It's generally the least favorable, maybe the easiest to build, but the least desirable. Usually, uh, when they're ported, so that means the speaker goes in, but there's a hole in the side or somewhere. And a port goes in, usually a cylindrical object with a certain diameter and length to optimally tune. You want an optimal size and port to get the best sound out of your speaker. And the, th the third one, which we use for the subwoofer, it is sealed, but it uses passive radiators. So wh what's a passive radiator? When, when you saw that first orange boombox, it looked like a subwoofer on the front. It was actually a passive radiator, which is simply a speaker with no componentry. So the subwoofer, and you remember the hole in the bottom, the subwoofer is down firing. And the guys who really know sound say when a subwoofer is firing down, then gravity is on your side, as opposed to sideways. So in general, we put the subwoofer fa down facing, and we put the uh, passive radiator one or two. There could be one in the front, and, one, and often one in the back. And the rule of thumb, for passive radiators is you should have one and a half to two times the size of your subwoofer. So if your subwoofer is three inches, then you should have four and a half to six inches of, of passive radiators. All right. Uh, material, we were using two pieces of smaller plywood laminated together, but half inch Baltic birch we found is, is very good. And um, again, this, these audio files say that's probably the best material. MDF is close, but Baltic Birch has like nine plies. Um, Thiel small numbers, I, I, we, we use them from the manufacturers mainly to get the right size of the enclosure and the right size of the port. There's a lot of other stuff you can learn about. I say sound. The more you know, the more you know you don't know. You know, you learn this, and then you think you know it more. And it, well, you can, so anyway. I'll keep moving. All right, so here's, here's an example of a three-way system, which do, does have, and I, should, I should, didn't talk about full-range drivers versus tweeters, right? So this is a three-way system, which has a subwoofer, a mid-range or a mid-woofer, and a tweeter. Uh, the, the orange one I showed you, you, you didn't see any tweeters. There were only um, one on each of the left and right. And that's called a full-range driver. So it picks up the, the mid-range you know, mid at 100 to 200 hertz, and it should perform well all the way up to 20,000 hertz. Uh, 20, 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz is generally accepted frequency spectrum that humans can hear. 
Of course, when you get my age, you can't hear 20,000 anymore. <laughs> okay. Woodworking design. So, again, four enclosures. Uh, the components. Uh, on the wedding cake one, right, you, you had to screw the top down. It wasn't very easy to unscrew it to, to work on your components. And then we had one removable panel on the back. And once you put a computer on board, you really want access to that. You don't want the top solid, and you're trying to get in there with a screwdriver or put a USB stick in. So the, the, both panels slide out, and you can work on it. it. It seems so easy now at the time, but it took us a while to figure that out. OK. Um, oh, the, the, the molding. So the pop quiz was, how, are the, how do the moldings differ? These are used for the two sides. I call it a, a double dado. So it has a dado on one side, and what you do is you, you make like a picture frame for one side, and another picture frame for the other side, and then the other dados are facing this way. So all of the end grain, except the, the panels going this way, all of the end grain on the sides are hidden. Not only are they hidden in here, but you have three, you have three sides for gluing, not just the butt joints are not, not good. Okay? And the, the wood is glued, and, and that's it. There's no screws or nails in these, in these models. You get good glue, glue joints, and they're going to be plenty solid for, for life. There, that's woodworking. Here's an example of a side. And this is the outside, and this is the inside. And um, I don't have a slide on this, but let me tell you this right now. We need another CNC job to cut one of the corners Cut these two little pieces of wood off so you can slide those panels in. And these two cuts are the, the, the separator that, that glues in to keep the top, you know, the components are above it and the speakers are below it. So you need a cut for there too. CNC machines. We, you know, we were doing all of this by hand and, you know, you try to cut circles with a jigsaw. It's not very accurate. So it finally uh, broke down and got a CNC machine. It, it's basically a router that, you know, and a router just spins and has cutting bits that can move in three dimensions, X, Y, and Z. All right? And you, you buy a $2,000 CNC machine, and you can't run it because you have to supply your own computer and your own software. But, hey, that's, that's the way things are today. Um, and it wasn't too hard, of course. The computer's running Linux. The input is G-code. So you have to produce G-code. And, and to me, the analogy is machine code, right? You guys, when you want to run stuff, you have to create machine code to have the computer do what, it, do what it's supposed to do. And it always does. You don't, you don't debug down to the machine code level, right? Same with G-code. You produce the G-code you want, and you send it to the CNC machine. And maybe the CNC machine is not as accurate as a computer, because there's a lot more moving parts. But you want it to basically do the same thing every time. You don't have to worry about the, the, quality, you know, the details of the G-code. So I would re recommend the CNC long mill. Why? Because it's the only CNC machine I've ever known, uh, owned, so I, I, I don't have much else to compare it with. But they have a good community, and they are also into free and open source software because they wrote the code called G-Sender, which is the piece, right, you have to create the G-code, and then you have to send the G-code, and, and the, 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 the software has to be able to talk to the CNC machine. All right, and the guys who wrote, who sell the CNC, CNC machines also wrote the software to drive it, and it's open source, 100% open source. So, and let me say that whenever I plug anybody, I'm not getting a dime from, from anybody. It's just this is my personal feelings, and I, I, you know, I always like it when people give honest input about what's good and what's bad. So I would recommend a dust boot, touch plate, um, T tracks and clamps. I'll talk about those. The Makita router. You, yeah, I'm happy with it. So here, here's a picture of the CNC machine. Here's your router, right? So this is the, this is the movie, this is the knife, the, you know, the cutting. And it, it moves in the X, Y, and Z. And I have a switch here, which powers the, the router itself, right? So when you hit that switch, the router turns on and starts spinning. You, you don't need to flip that until you're ready to cut. But it also turns on the, the dust collection system at the same time. All right, we have a picture of the dust collection system. Basically, it's a shop vac with a um, cyclone. So the big chips go, fall down that cyclone, and then the little chips go into the, into the uh, vacuum. And this whole system 
cost about two thousand dollars. You know, if I had to buy this ten years ago, it probably would have been two or three times that price. Okay, moving on, electronics and components. So you need power, right? You need electricity. So these boom boxes do not have batteries. You know, the f one of the first questions I got from my daughter was, well, how, how long does it take to recharge? And I'm like, well, there's not really any batteries. Uh, it, it would be possible, but it would be complicated because you would need the batteries to produce two voltages, so you would need a separate circuit to produce the five volts for the Raspberry Pi. But you want to bring your AC in and follow electrical code. So I put uh, an electrical box and you know socket and a cover plate. And then once you once you convert down to DC, the rules about safety and electricity are not so stringent. When you're at 24 volts DC, you know it might you might feel it a little, but it's not going to hurt you. <laughs> Amplifier. Oh, I have a prop. I put that in orange so I remember to show you my prop. <clears throat> the first uh, wedding cake. This was the amplifier. It was like $12 at the time. I think it's $15. But it's, it's pretty basic. It only has one knob. It does not have Bluetooth. And when you turn the knob, it doesn't have an on-off. OK, this one is what we're using in the orange one, the, the latest model. And you notice it's got five knobs, so it's got a volume. But also, you can hear a click. So you don't need a separate on-off switch, right? If it's built in, less is more, right? And you have a. Two for the subwoofer, one is the output level of the subwoofer, and one is the cutoff frequency, right? That moves the cutoff in that, in that chart left and right, and then bass and treble. Okay, what's next? Microphone, oh, power supplies. So you'll see two power supplies. You want to go with it. Now, oh, also, that amp is rated, rated at uh, 30 watts. 30 watts and 60. So left channel 30 watts, right channel 30 watts, and subwoofer 60. But you would need a 120 watt power supply in to actually be able to get 120 watts out. And really, the 10% factor. So I would say you need 132 watts to be able to get 120 watts out. Um, this one is rated at 50, 50, and 100. Left and right 50 watts, subwoofer 100 watts. So you would need a 220 watt power supply. That's, that's a pretty big power supply to dr fully drive this. We went with a 5 volt times, I'm sorry, 24 volt times 5 amps, so about 120 watts. So probably the most we're really going to get out of that is 110 watts. But let me tell you, in a room, it would fill up a room this size. Certainly a, you know, a, a bedroom or a, a living room, definitely. I think you wouldn't want to turn it up past 7 or 8 in this room either. It, it's loud. All right, microphone, don't buy a cheap one. I need to experiment. The, you know, the Amazon Alexa and the Google Home, they have this beam forming, so there's probably four or six or more microphones so they can tell where the sound is coming from. But we've just gone with a single microphone. Don't buy cheap ones. Lessons learned, or line in. OK, I almost skipped it. Line in or aux in. We started with this. And you can see these three. You probably can't see these three tiny little um, contacts. And we had to solder them. And that's, that's asking for trouble, right, for those solder joints to come apart. So if you can avoid soldering, we, we found this. I, I would love to have one of these that has a cap screw on it, but I can't find that. So this plugs in, no soldering. You have to make that parallel and put it in and glue it on the back so it doesn't get pushed through. All right, that's all the props I got. Lessons learned, avoid soldering, use quality connectors. So we were soldering every single connection. It's time consuming. If you get really good connectors, then a, a crimp will work. Use the amplifier's built-in Bluetooth. I'll talk about that. If you're going to use tweeters, have the crossover network. So the crossover network is inductors, capacitors, and resistors. So it determines where that, that crossover is, where those three lines intersect. And try to keep your power on one side and your, try to keep your power and your signal away from each other. So here is a crimping plier that I found, and I'll recommend it because it's the best one I've ever used. You can crimp it for three different wire sizes, and then this is heat shrink, so it'll come around the, um, around the insulation. Computer hardware and software, system on a chip, Raspberry Pi with four gigabytes, has the best history, the best community. community of, but unfortunately, due to the global chip shortage, 
It's very hard to get a Raspberry Pi 4. I wish I had bought, you know, a hundred of them or, or, you know, a couple dozen of them when they were $55, advertised price. I saw one for $200 with, with no power supply and no heat sink on, on Amazon. So uh, that's a blocker. I, I tried one of these alternatives and it really didn't work too well. Power supply for the Raspberry Pi, use the official Raspberry Pi 5 volt. I think it's two amps at this point. Some of them claim they're two amps, but I often get under voltage detected, under voltage detected, and it's annoying. So use good power supply. Oh, digital audio converter. So the audio coming off of a Raspberry Pi is not, you know, audio file quality. It's, I think, 44 bits sampling. You, you want oh, 192,000 bits sampling. And again, I'm not a, I'm not a big um, sound guy. But basically, you buy a hat, which, a DAC hat, digital to analog converter, and you plug it on top of the Raspberry Pi, and then you get much better sound coming out. Is it audio? Uh, and it also provides the headphone amp. Remember, the, the one had a headphone amp that comes off of the DAC hat. And is it audiophile quality? I don't know. I'm not an audiophile. Sorry. All right. Computer hardware and software. I'm recommending Ubuntu Linux server, long-term support. Uh, I'm a corporate guy, certainly the Raspberry Pi OS is a, an alternative, and, and if you have your favorite Linux distro, fine, it will probably work. Uh, I am recommending the Mate desktop, it seems to use the least amount of memory, uh, so you don't, you don't, if you have four gigabytes, you don't want to be paging, right, it, things will slow down really fast. You, you need a media player, so MV is supported by um, Mycroft. Pulse Audio and also are pulled in. Linux Bluetooth, turn it off. I mucked around with Bluetooth on Linux for days and days, and it's just a hassle, and they, they want your password. Uh, the, you know, the Bluetooth on this, there's no password. It just works. It's really fast. So turn off Linux Bluetooth, and let's talk about Mycroft now. So again, I couldn't do much with voice input until I found Mycroft, so I would recommend it. You know, this is one of their charts just saying voice is going to be huge, right? I, I say the 2020s are going to probably be remembered for voice. We'll say, we'll say, remember in the 2010s when we used to walk around and we were typing on our cell phones and walking into street signs? Um, you, you, can, you can talk to your phone, right? Uh, okay. So how does Mycroft work? How does this solution work? And really, any, any voice assistant, you, you know, you say, you ask it a question or you tell it to play some music, it goes to a microphone and is converted into a waveform. Then it's always listening for a wake word. So the default wake word is, hey, Mycroft. And none of your sound is going anywhere. It's, it's staying locally. It's not going to the internet until the wake word is heard. And then your voice is recorded until a very short, less than half a second, I think, quarter second to a half a second of pause, and it stops recording. So, hey, Mycroft, play Adele, right? And then play Adele has to be converted from a waveform to text. And now you have literally the string, play Adele, and the intent parser says, well, what skill, right? And so you can add skills to Mycroft. You can write your own skills, which is really cool. And... Um, this intent parser says, well, I know MB. MB is a music player, and I know that MB knows how to play music. So it sends it to MB, and then MB can go out to the internet. It can go to local file systems. It has to find the Adele file, right? And it, it really doesn't even have to say, you know, sometimes you don't want to hear, okay, I am now playing Adele. And it's like, just play it for me, right? So the music just comes out, and then it goes to your ear. All right, I told you how, I'm gonna, how to build a smart boombox in 14 easy steps. All right, I'm not going to read each one of these steps, but we'll go through them. And the, the design step is really what I'm talking about right now. So I don't, I don't have a chart on it because the entire presentation is how to design this. All right? So then you've got to get the wood. Birch pilot, plywood is probably too expensive to mail. So you've got to go to a local lumber yard where you might also get your three-quarter hardwood, three-quarter inch hardwood. But uh, I like stevewalllumber.com. They, they, the shipping costs are not that bad. Uh, drawings, okay. Drawings and easel zip file. So I said this is open source. I, ideally, I was going to have all of this out on the internet, and it was you know, going to be 100% ready, but it's not. So if anybody wants any of this, feel free to email me. And I was hoping to have a kit. I do, I do have kind of a stake in the ground. I've got smartboomboxes.com as a website, but it's, um, it's got a lot of work to be done. So we're getting there. All right. Um, 
components, so if you want to build one yourself, and you can get the PDF, I believe, of this presentation, all of these links are hot right to the part that I use. So that's for your convenience. It took a while to get all those. So the components, $138 for the Model 1000. Then when I say Model 1000 and Model 1200, I'm, I'm hoping that that might be the, you know, the retail price if you, if you make a nice one. So you know, can you sell one of these for 1200 bucks? Hopefully. Uh, and the Model 1200 has a bigger subwoofer. And it does have tweeters. And we just f listened to the first prototype. And the treble, the, the highs sound a lot better with good tweeters. But they don't sound better with cheap tweeters. So don't buy cheap components. All right. And the components that are common to both are $257. There's a lot of parts there. So the total cost, without any wood, is this, this one shocked me. I didn't realize how much money I've been spending, <laughs> is almost $400. But over $425 if you go with the, the, the bigger model. So here I have enough components for two Model 1200, so I set them down on the, on the dining room table, and I'm like, wow, that's over $800 worth of components right there. <laughs> All right, make drawings. I'm, just, I'm still kind of old-fashioned. I, I, I wish I knew how to, uh, I, I wish I had like an AutoCAD software and knew how to use it or Google SketchUp, but I just go with the old-fashioned drafting. But the important part is you need the x and the y values for all of your cuts. Now, once you have it, you can create the G code for the CNC. And I found easel.com. It, it is free, but it keeps trying to sell you the, the, you know, the pro version. But you can avoid it if you don't use certain features. And we've learned, we, so we haven't paid for anything. And it's really neat because it's browser based and it's in the cloud. So your CNC machine's down in the basement and it's cold and you want to work on the, the, you know, the, the drawings, you can work up in the warm uh, office, do the drawings, and then you go downstairs and you pull the G-code down because all, uh, all your projects are in the cloud. So that's, that's really handy. So this is Easel through a browser, and we are making the cuts for uh, the Model 1000. And you'll see, well, that's an awful lot of holes in one piece of plywood. And the reason is, is this is actually going to be four, co four components, right? This is the top, the front, and this is the bottom, and this is the back. You remember I had two passive radiators. So that's going to be passive radiator, passive radiator, subwoofer, full range driver, full range driver. Okay. And now you go downstairs. Oh, this is the 1200. You notice extra holes for the tweeters, but basically the same, same thing. Okay. Now you've got to cut the main piece on the CNC machine. So you cut your Baltic birch into quarters or thirds. You know, you design everything to get the maximum use of your plywood. And then you, you cut the big main blank, and you square it, you clamp it, you zero it, you load it into g sender, and then you cut it. And then you sand the good side. All right, so you square it with a square. You set down clamps. I'm going to talk about clamps. I'm getting behind. And then uh, I love it when I first got this to work. This is zeroing it. So the CNC machine knows where the origin is and where the very top of the plywood is. Because it, it has to be really accurate to start, or you're not going to get a good cut. So I think when it, when, it's work, when it works, it's pretty cool. So now it knows its origin, OK? And now you load your code into G-Sender. Right? You worked on it upstairs. Now you have G-Code. You save the G-Code. As a, as a file, you pull it down as a file, and um, you load it into, this is the G sender I told you about that drives the CNC machine. OK, now we'll see the CNC machine in action for a few seconds. You get a little bit of the noise, but none of the dust, OK? <laughs> and it, it's kind of, you have to stand by the res, red switch. It's kind of mesmerizing. You're just like, oh, wow, cool. <laughs> All right. Um, clamps, that, I bought the clamps that came, you know, that they offered, and I would say you could probably buy your own bolts, and if you can find these little red toggles, do not use a metal clamp. Here, the, the CNC router bit was not supposed to hit the clamp, but it did, and thankfully it only hit the plastic. If you have a CNC machine running and your bit's spinning at 25,000 RPMs, and it hits, that's steel, that's not even aluminum, it hits steel, it's, it's not a pretty sight, it's like, you know, like a car accident. So, so we switched to, and, and these are longer, so we, we cut the clamps, the wooden clamps, on the CNC machine. 
And then you can see there was an accident here, but it, it went right through it because it's wood. All right. So now we've cut it and you flip it over and you see that went to about the bottom, which is what it was designed to. It didn't quite go to the bottom on the back, so what I think has happened is my CNC machine has settled, so there's a program to cut every, you put a flat bottom bit on and to flatten the entire, so I'm gonna have to re-flatten it. So now you cut out all the panels and moldings on a table saw, right there were four. You have one big piece and you cut them into four. And I found, and I tried to cut the moldings on the CNC machine. It's, it's, not, it's not magic, right? So we found the, the dado blade was the best, but you have to be careful. This is called a feather board. So it's pushing the project to the side so you don't have to do that with your fingers. You don't want your fingers that close. And here's the uh, dado bit, blade. You put the two, two big blades on the outside and these are called chippers that go in the middle. If, it's, if the wood is 480, 480,000, so you want your uh, dado to be about 490, give about 10,000 for glue and warp. <clears throat> and he, so here's all the pieces. And you want to dry fit it before you glue it. Gluing can be a, a tough, tough night. We tried, again, we tried to clamp, so I made some cam clamps and they didn't really work too well. And then label the panels, okay? If you, if, if you want to charge $1,000 for a boombox, you want to have nice labels. And I hate these, these products that come out with no labels. You just have to figure out what button does what, right? Um, so we, we, I bought a Fox Alien laser engraver. Haven't been able to drive it from Linux, so I would not recommend it. And I'm still using Dymo labels, right? You, you, you do a little sticky and it's kind of bush leak. All right, so we've got to fix that. Then you glue your sides up first. I'm using these picture frame clamps, which are good because it keeps the glue off of the web clamp itself. So then you have this. This was the old one, the old web clamp, and the glue would, it would stick onto the web clamp itself. And then you have the, mo call it the monolithic glue. Once you have two sides, you have, really have to glue everything together at the same time. And it can be, it can be a, a tough night, but if it goes well, then you're, then you're happy. Okay, finish. I, uh, this is what I use. I use, usually use natural stain, but you saw with the orange one, I wanted to get some color, so I, I stained it orange first. And then I have what's called the mixture. You, you put one-third polyurethane, one-third boiled linseed oil, and one third tur turpentine, you stir it together, you wipe it, you brush it on, and you wipe it off. And you can do these two steps right in a row. So it, it really is pretty quick. And then once and you do that before you've done any of your components, right, because you don't want to get this on your components. And then after, you can put this uh, feed and wax on, which makes it just look a little shinier and a little nicer. Okay. Install the components. I, I, I don't have a, a whole lot to say here. Just leave yourself enough wire. Hopefully your enclosure and your components and they all fit together and um, your connectors are correct. So here's an example of how not. This is a different one we were trying. And we didn't even put a computer on board, we put a battery on board uh, so, you, so it's portable. But that whole thing had to be wired ahead of time and then glued afterwards. So if, you had, if we have to get to the components, like if this tweeter goes bad, uh, it would be very hard to change. <laughs> so it just better not go bad, that's all. Okay, here's a picture of that one. Yeah, it sounds amazing. It's got a nine inch passive radiator on the back and you can tell the, the, how much uh, charges on your batteries. Okay, so now we're getting to the computer part, the, 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 the Linux part. I put the Raspberry Pi on a one inch piece of wood so it's up higher so you can you know, plug little things in. Uh, there's a question of, do we, you need a fan hat in between? Do you need a fan to cool down the Raspberry Pi? I bought one, but I haven't used it. The temperature has not been a problem, but I always keep the top open, so. Um, you need two custom standoffs. The back of the Raspberry Pi, you can just put screws on because that's where the hats plug together. On the front, you have to kind of make, you know, plastic standoffs so that it goes down well. So here, here's an example of that orange one driving a, a general purpose computer. I, I, I do my Gmail on that because I can't get the Gmail from a corporate. Uh, here's a, not the best picture, but here is, let me see. This is the amplifier. And this is the Raspberry Pi 4 under the DAC hat, right? So the DAC hat plugs on top of it. And you'll see you have RCA out. So this is your quality audio out. This is a 3.5 millimeter Y cable. Why do we need a Y cable? 
because you'll have one input coming from USB or, or aux in, and you have one input coming from your computer. So you, 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 know, you use either. I guess you could, you could power, you could have both of them playing music at the same time. Probably not recommended. This is the five volt power supply, and this big one took up a lot of room, is the 24 volt power supply for the amplifier. All right, so now we have a computer on board, and now we want to install Linux. So real quickly, oh, and I have, and you can email me, I have more details in, a, I call it the cookbook. I, I work for IBM, I did Red Book, so it kind of looks like an IBM Red Book. Uh, so you download, download Ubuntu server or whatever you want to use. You copy the ISO image to a micro SSD card. You plug it in the Raspberry Pi, which can be tricky with, when you have big fat fingers. You connect the monitor, keyboard and mouse, and you boot it, and you log in and, and change the password. I like to get onto the Wi-Fi right away so I can uh, SSH from my other box. And I recommend use, not using Ubuntu, but using the user and group Pi. That's optional. Oh, so because I have big fingers, I always use a needle nose to plug that. It's kind of hard to get that chip in it now. All right, once you have Linux, I say prevent automatic upgrades. I don't like Linux saying, you know, I'm going to go update myself right now. And, you know, it sucks down all your CPU and everything goes slow. Install a Linux desktop, optional. Set the time zone. Turn off the default sound card. You remember I said the the sound coming right out of the Raspberry Pi is pretty bad, so turn it off right away. It's, it's, a, it's a, a kernel parameter, and then you, you have to either give it, or I think it's built in now, to turn on the, the DAC hat, depending on the manufacturer. Then you want to test your microphone and speakers. Right? Your voice assistant is not going to work if, neither, if both of those are not working. You have to have microphone coming in, it records it, and uh, sound coming out. MB I use for the music player, turn off Linux Bluetooth, as I mentioned. Set up music on the USB drive. You know, I ripped all my CDs to MP3 files, so I got, you know, like 3,000 MP3 files. You put them on a USB drive, and MB will index them, which is nice, because now your music doesn't require <coughs> streaming. Okay. Then, now we're moving on to Mycroft. You download Mycroft, you install and build it. You set Mycroft to boot with systemd, even though I don't like systemd, it works. Uh, register your device with Mycroft. Mycroft has to know what the device is. Um, it just does. I'm not sure that I, I like that, but it, it, that's how it is required to work. Ah, all right. Set up a music streaming service skill. Right now, Mycroft does not have, they had Spotify and Pandora, and both of those manufacturers backed off because they said, I think, you know, we don't want Mycroft doing the voice inputs, so they're going to do their own. <clears throat> but hopefully, Mycroft will soon be partnering with a, a music service. And I, I would like to add an internet radio skill, but right now, that is not necessarily working. And then you start using your, your smart boombox and cross your fingers. So then you do test and debug. I say, hey, Mycroft, what time is it? What is the weather? What's the news? And your, all of your voice input and the skills output, there's like four different log files. And if things don't work right the first time, then you can start things in debug mode. You can show, and that shows the log in real times. And again, the Mycroft has a good uh, support, you know, online open source support structure, so there's a Forum and there's a chat. Um, fair compensation to artists. Uh, Napster, if, if an artist wants to earn a dollar, you know, to get paid a dollar, Napster only requires 53 streams, where Deezer requires 17 times that. Okay, so to me, if, okay, I'm running out of time. To me, if, <laughs> if we're paying $10 a month, I would like the most amount of the money to go to the artist, and the least amount of the money to go to the middleman. Okay, so, all right. So, good timing. Uh, uh, email me with any questions. I put my cell phone up there, and they say, why do you put your cell phone? I say, oh, nobody ever calls anyway. <laughs> um, smartboomboxes.com is a little bit all over the floor right now. The cookbook, I will update. Uh, contributions, my buddy John, Mycroft, CNC, 
a small business development center helped me get the website going. And the Open Voice Network I've been working with, yeah, uh, so Mycroft web pages. And does anybody want to partner? <laughs> I'm uh, doing this kind of by myself, but come up afterwards if, if you like that. All right. That's it. It's 2.45. Um, any questions? One question. Yeah. Assuming you were using to get your, your 5 volts or 12 volts, and in the later design you moved to having like discrete, like sort of state style plug in one more power supply. Yeah. Just, why did you migrate to that? Well, no, the, the, the one power supply was not 5 volt and 12 volt. I should probably look into 5 volt and 12 volt, but I would really want 24 volt. So, oh. you know, they're hard to find. But I, I could look into a, a single power supply that gives me both. Yes. And then, and then the battery. Well, then when you get the battery involved, it, it gets con conflicting too. Real quick, one more question. Is there a reason you want to drive straight high floor as opposed to the compute? Um, because that's the first one I bought and I haven't tried the compute. You can still get computes right now? No. <laughs> they're, 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 un they're unobtainium also. All right, I, don't, I, I want to be fair to the next speaker who has to come in and set up. So thank you very much. I hope you guys enjoyed this and contact me. Thank you. Uh, I, I work in Jersey. I live in New York.